Hello and welcome to this two-part presentation where we will be discussing how to conduct a self-review of a custom STM32 schematic. This presentation will cover several main areas of focus when conducting a STM32 schematic review and share some hardware debugging tips and tricks. In the first part of the video, we will begin by covering approximately half of the schematic checklist, which highlights some key areas to go over when conducting a STM32 schematic review. Then in part two, we will go over the other half of the schematic checklist and finally wrap up this series by going through a couple of hardware debugging tips. There is a total of seven key areas to cover on our schematic checklist. In part one, we will begin by discussing pinout and alternate functions, followed by power, clocks, and debug. Then in the second part of the video, we will wrap up our discussion on the schematic checklist by going through boot, reset, and five volt tolerant pins. The first step is to note down the letter and number of your selected STM32. Using the specified STM32's datasheet, refer to the ordering information section to further dissect device information pertaining to the STM32 device. In today's presentation, we will use the STM32 F733 IET as an example. Taking a look at the ordering information section within the STM32 F73's datasheet, we can see that the 733 pertains to the device's subfamily, I pertains to the pin count, E pertains to the flash memory size, and lastly, T pertains to the package type. Using this package information, we can further locate the pinout diagram of the selected STM32 in the datasheet as shown here on the left-hand side. The next step is to verify that the alternate function is available on the pin you have chosen to use. In the STM32's datasheet, there will be a pin and ball definition table. In this table, please locate your STM32 device, package information, and have the pinout diagram handy from the previous step to search for the STM32's pin number and pin name. Every row in this table indicates a pin's name and the alternate functions available on that pin. A secondary table that can also be referenced for alternate functions is the STM32 alternate function mapping table, which is also located in the STM32's datasheet. All of the STM32's IOs contain internal pull-up and pull-down resistors that can be programmed accordingly using CubeMX, therefore eliminating the need of any external resistors. Typically, the values of these resistors range from 30k ohms to 40k ohms, but it is best to verify your selected device's internal resistors values. These values can be found in the IO static characteristics table in the STM32's datasheet. To minimize and reduce extra current consumption, all unused I.O. pins should not be left floating, but rather be configured as analog inputs. This is particularly significant during low power modes. Some of the newer device families may already have unused I.O.s set as analog input, therefore please refer to the device's GPIO section in the selected STM32's reference manual for additional information or to verify whether or not your STM32 may already do this. CubeMX also gives you the option to set all free pins as analog. To do so, select the Project Manager tab then select the co-generator option on the left sidebar, and finally scroll down to HAL settings where you can enable or disable the option to set all free pins as analog. When reviewing the power connections to your board, it's important to have the necessary capacitors called for and for these capacitors to be placed as closely as possible to the power ports. As indicated earlier in the presentation, we will be using the SCM32 F733 as our microcontroller of choice. Therefore, I have chosen to use application note 4661 and locate the power supply scheme for my selected STM32. Please refer to the appropriate Getting Started with STM32 Series MCU Hardware Development application note to locate your selected STM32's power supply scheme diagram and for any additional information on power designs. There are two documents you will need to reference when reviewing your STM32's clock design. The first document is application note 2867, the oscillator design guide. This design guide gives a list of crystals that have been deemed by ST as compatible with various STM32 devices. 
The second important document is your selected STM32's datasheet. This datasheet is important for two reasons. The first reason being that it details the supported oscillator frequency range in the respective HSC or LSC oscillator characteristics table. The second reason is because it will also detail the crystal's gain margin or maximum critical crystal value needed for startup. Some of the newer devices will have a maximum critical crystal value, while other devices will have a crystal gain margin. In any case, for appropriate startup conditions, the gain margin needs to be a value larger than 5 and the maximum critical crystal value must be less than the stated max value. For more details, please refer to the Oscillator Design Guide application note where you can find these gain margin and maximum critical crystal formulas as well as refer to an example calculation. At a minimum, the debug signals required are SWD IO, SWD clock, NRST, VDD, and VSS. If supported by the selected STM32, other available debugger options include SWD, JTAG, and ETM. Please verify in the selected STM32's datasheet for the list of supported debugger options. With that, thank you for your time as we will conclude part 1 of the STM32 schematic self-review video here. Please tune into the second and final part of this video series where we will complete the schematic checklist and provide you with some tips and tricks that can be useful during debugging.